do realize that we're now in the session where you can actually go to a different room, right? <laughs> if you want. Like the previous keynote, you had no choice. You only could go here. Uh, now you have a chance to escape. Uh, and if you want to escape during the talk, you know, go out the back, please. <coughs> Help. That's um, Anyway, uh, my name is Magnus Hagender. I'm here to talk to you about Postgres 11, uh, or what will become Postgres 11. Uh, it's almost there. Is anyone already running Postgres 11 in production? <laughs> really? There, I know there are Postgres consultants in here, and I'm the only one who runs Postgres 11 in production. You guys are boring. <coughs> okay, so who's running Postgres 10 in production? Okay, that's, that's not a bad number. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the, uh, all the versions going back. Uh, instead, let's uh, move on. So as I said, my name is Magnus Hagener. I work for a company called Red Pill Linpro. We're an open source uh, services business based in Scandinavia. So I'm uh, out of Stockholm in Sweden myself uh, and do sort of all sorts of things around open source where obviously my focus point is Postgres, uh, which is why I'm here. Uh, within the Postgres project, uh, I'm one of the core team members. Uh, I am a committer though I haven't actually committed a lot of code for Postgres 11. I'm hoping to get a little bit more of that done into whatever comes after. Uh, and I'm also currently serving as president of the board for Postgres Europe, uh, which is the European counterpart to Postgres US, which is the organization here that runs this uh, very conference right here. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, enough about me. Let's talk about Postgres 11. Uh, well, number one, Postgres 11 isn't actually done yet. right? So disclaimer, it's not there yet. It's very close at this point. Uh, there are many things are in there. It is at this point, I would say, highly unlikely that we're going to remove something that's in there today. But it hasn't been released yet. We may. Right? If at this point somebody finds a critical bug in what is about to become Postgres 11 that can't be easily fixed or that sort of requires bigger changes, things, it may just be removed. So the features that we're going to talk about today are probably going to be in Postgres 11. Uh, and I started doing this talk when it was a lot less likely, and at least one of the things that were in my first version of this talk is not in Postgres 11, so it does happen. Uh, but that was sometime back in like April. Uh, at this point, it's reasonably stable. Now, if you look through the schedule of, of Postgres 11, development actually started uh, just over a year ago in August uh, of 2017, <coughs> when we branched off uh, what's eventually to become Postgres version 10, which at least some of you are currently using. Um, the way that we work in Postgres is all of our, our feature developments happens on the master branch, on the head, uh, and then we branch off stable branches for every release. So when, when we branched off a, a branch called uh, release 10, that's when we opened up the master branch for putting new features in, into what would then eventually become uh, Postgres 11. Uh, and then of course, every, everybody today works with some sort of iterative development model uh, in Postgres. We call it commit fests, because of course, everybody has to have their own name for it. I mean, of course you do. Uh, and the general idea is that during development, we spend one month building features, right? writing code, submitting patches. Then we spend the next month reviewing those patches and getting them, hopefully, committed, if they're good enough, and, and getting that work. And then we just repeat that cycle. And this, this period of review and committing is what we call the commit fest. Right? Uh, so for Postgres 11, we ran four of these commit fests, uh, one in September last year, one in November, one in January, and one in March. Uh, and at the end of this commit fest four, uh, at the end of March, or actually a little bit into April, that's when we declared basically feature freeze uh, for Postgres 11. Uh, in, we had a couple of releases. The latest one that's out now is beta three, which came out in August. We have been targeting September this year for release. Some of you may have access to a calendar that tells you, hey, we're in September now. Uh, which is true, so the current target is we're probably going to end up in early October or so. But that is still the target. Uh, we don't, we had done a fixed release date set, but we're looking at hopefully a month or so until we have a release out. Uh, which is, you know, please help us test that, otherwise that might become a lot more than a month. Or we put it out in a month and it doesn't work, that's even worse. <clears throat> so let's go into the features. Uh, for those of you who have seen me do these talks before, I think I've done them here a number of times in a, at different uh, scenarios. I'm, I've picked a bunch of features. I'm just going to tell you rather quickly about them. And then there are going to be other presentations throughout this conference that will highlight in more detail how some of them work. Uh, and I've tried to group them a little bit. I'm talking about DBA and administration features, 
uh, I'm talking about SQL and developer features, and someone will be like, well, you know, aren't we all supposed to not have DBA and SQL? What's the difference between a DBA and a developer, really? Uh, so I've just made it easy and said, well, DBA, the things that I group under DBA are things that are not SQL, like config file changes and stuff. And if they're SQL, then they're a developer. <laughs> In reality, it's, it's all sort of blurred lines, right? Uh, then we're gonna specifically talk about a few things around backup and replication. Uh, and of course, everybody loves performance, so uh, let's talk a bit about a few of the things that we've done that's gonna make Postgres 11 very fast. But let's start with DBA and administration. Uh, let's start with a small feature uh, that's probably not gonna help a lot of you, but when it does, it's gonna help you a lot for those people. Uh, as you know, Postgres, as, as you probably know, Postgres uses 16 megabyte files for transaction logs for the while. Uh, that has been configurable for years, but you just, all you had to do was rebuild Postgres from source, which means in, in practice for most people, it wasn't really configurable because you don't wanna do that. You wanna use whatever packages are on your platform. Um, Postgres 11 will let you change it. Uh, you will be able to change it at init DB time, so you won't be able to change it sort of during runtime, but you won't have to rebuild Postgres to change it. Now I'd say there are two use cases for this. Probably the most common one is, is you, if you're in an environment that generates lots and lots of while, uh, the main problem around the 16 megabyte files are that Postgres will fire off your archive command once per 16 megabyte file. And if that becomes many, time, many, many times per second, that becomes very expensive. So in those cases, you can now increase and say instead, you know, let's do 100 megabyte files. You're now firing off a lot fewer archive commands. You still have to do something with all that data, uh, but there'll be fewer commands. Of course, you can also decrease the size of it. Uh, I think it's very uncommon that you need to go below 16 megabytes. Um, most of you probably have 16 megabytes of disk space. I do have, personally, I have a customer who used to rebuild Postgres with a smaller, well, segment size because it was too big. I, that's a very narrow use case. I don't think most of you, like, if you need to go sl smaller, you probably don't want to go smaller. <laughs> Just leave it there. Stephen? There are only certain values you can't set it to. There are only certain, yeah, you can't set it to, like, 27 bytes. It's, yeah, maybe you can't, you, yeah, you can't set it to 100. You have to set it to, like, 128. Yeah. That's, um, so anyway, uh, Next thing worth noticing, because this may break your applications, may break your monitoring. Who is using PG stat statements? All those of you who are not using PG stat statements, you should be looking at using PG stat statements. <laughs> it's an excellent way to get insight into how your application is performing and what it's actually doing. Now, PG stat statements is basically a list of your uh, couple of thousand most common queries, right? And there is a hash value in it that tells you that, that you can use in tracking it that says, you know, the hash for this query so that you can find the query again. That used to be 32-bit and it's now 64-bit. So what it mainly means if you're snapshotting this data, for example, into a separate table or something to analyze, you've got to change that to be a big int. Uh, if you are using third-party plugins or third-party analytics software that does this for you, you're probably going to need to upgrade it. Uh, there are a few of them around this, like the POA tool, the workload analyzer. Uh, it has been updated, you just have to remember to actually upgrade it to a version that supports the 64-bit one. The main reason for this is there's much less risk of collision. The problem when you're working based on, on the query hash is, of course, if the query is, is on the top list and then it falls off the top list and then it comes back on the top list later, the only way that you can know it's the same query is to look at the query hash. And in Postgres 10 and earlier, it, it took about 50,000 unique queries uh, before you reach the 25% risk of having a collision on this hash number and then misidentifying this as being the same query as one you've seen before. Uh, with the 64-bit, that's now 3 billion unique queries. And I, I'd venture to say that most of you probably don't have 3 billion unique queries. These are after the queries have been normalized and, and parameters have been removed. But it's a possible breaking change, so keep an eye out on your uh, monitoring software to make sure it doesn't do that. Um, Moving on with a couple of things about indexes. Uh, many of you have probably tuned your queries by changing the statistics target on your columns in Postgres because your estimates, you did your explain, you got the wrong estimates, you increased the statistics target to collect more data. Uh, you have been unable to do that previously if you had indexes on expressions, like functional indexes or expressional indexes did not support doing this because you could only change the statistics target on a column, which would then indirectly change the target for all the indexes on this column. 
Uh, you're now able to do it specifically on an index. So if we have, like in this example, I've got an index on x and y, and then for some reason the value of z plus t. Now if you actually need to change the t statistics target for this, you could change it for x and you could change it for y because they're columns, but z plus t is an, um, is an expression. So if you actually change it on the column z and t, Postgres doesn't care because it's the expression that's in the index. In this case, what you can now do is alter the index, alter column three set statistics and change it for that one. And at this point, uh, columns in indexes don't have names. So the three that we have here ref just references column number three in the index, which would be the expression in part, right? Yes? Can, so question is, can you create statistics on expressions that are not in an index? No. But uh, also, Postgres wouldn't use them anyway, so. <laughs> yeah, you could presume it, but no, you can't. Uh, because that, that would be interesting. <laughs> yes? Is it valuable with partial indexes? It, it could be, but you could do, like, you could already look at the statistics for a partial index on a colon. Uh, but it's it's going to be collected across the whole uh, thing. It's going to be collected across the whole index. Uh, the other thing that we can now do with indexes is we can make them slower by including data in them that we couldn't do before. Uh, this is called include indexes, which means we can add columns to the index that we're not going to use. Now, it kind of sounds like it's a bad idea, right? Because one of the reasons we like indexes is they're nice, small, and compact, and this will make them less small. Uh, but the idea here is we can make them use index-only scans. Now, for a regular index, we can typically just add another column to the index, and it'll be fine. We'll, we'll scan them fine. But if we have a unique index, so in this example, uh, I have an index on my ID field is unique, right? And if I then want to add a second field to that index in order to be able to do an index-only scan, if I recreate my index on ID, comma, second field, then suddenly my ID is not unique anymore. So I can't do that. What I can then do is I can say this create unique index using Btree on ID include second field, which means the uniqueness in the index itself will still only apply to the ID column, but the contents of second field will be stored in the index. So if I'm running a query that only accesses the ID and the second field of this, I can do an index only scan and I never have to actually look up the data in the table. Uh, the data still goes. I mean, this will make my index bigger and less efficient, but it's always, like with most things with indexes, it's a trade-off. Yes? How many columns can you add? I think as many as you want. Uh, Something like a thousand? Like, as long as you can keep it under eight. As, as long as you, like the index still has to fit. Uh, yeah, you have to fit two, two uh, tuples on a page in Btree, right? So it's a, it needs to be 4K. Yeah, yeah. But, so if you can fit a thousand columns in that, you can do a thousand columns. <laughs> You're gonna do a lot of typing when you write this, but yeah. Uh, so uh, next feature I'll mention around this, uh, who is using PG Prewarm today? Uh, one or two, okay. Mostly the usual suspects. So the idea behind PG Prewarm, it already exists in previous versions of Postgres. Uh, the idea is you can call PG Prewarm to have it snapshot what's in your cache and just store a list of it. Uh, so the idea is, for example, you can snapshot your, shot your cache, restart Postgres, and tell you to reload the cache the way it looked before you start, stopped it, right? Uh, the new thing in Postgres 11 is it'll be able to do this automatically for you if you enable it. Uh, so by default, for example, it'll, every five minutes, it'll snapshot your cache. And if, the post, if you restart Postgres or if it crashes and restarts, it'll go for the last snapshot it had, and it'll reload the cache with that data. Now, it obviously, it doesn't actually store the content of the cache. It's just a long list of saying, you know, these blocks from this table, these blocks from this table, uh, so that when it restarts, it'll asynchronously fire off a background worker that loads all this data back up. Uh, regular pre-warring can be really useful, for example, if you're doing failovers to a replica, and it's not much fun to do failover into a replica with an empty cache, uh, so you can pre-warm it that way. This can be very useful for things like, you know, crash restart, because it'll get an approximation uh, of what you actually need. Yes? Does it stall uh, startup? Or it does not stall startup. No, it'll, it'll start in the background and, and backfill the cache. But you will start taking queries. Obviously, they won't be cached, but you will start taking queries before you get there. Uh, Postgres 10 started a long process of 
getting rid of super user requirements in Postgres and making more things controlled by roles that you can then selectively grant. Things like being able to view statistics and view settings and things. Uh, three new of these roles appear in Postgres 11. PG read server file, PG write server files, and PG execute server program. It's hopefully obvious what they do. If you grant PG read server files, that controls uh, the function that is basically PG read file, that you can open any file on the server and read it. And it also controls server side copy. So obviously these are fairly high privileged, especially things like PG execute server program. If you grant that to somebody, they can run pro processes on the server as the Postgres user. So arguably you can say there that there it's almost super user because you can use that process to like hack into Postgres, but it's still better and we should just stop using super user. If you're using super user today, really look particularly start at Postgres 10 and look at the roles that were added there because uh, they're even more useful than these and make sure you stop using super user wherever it's possible. Uh, department of much requested features that we actually have now, alter table add column. Okay, we had alter table add column. You may have noticed that. But the problem used to be if you added a column and you made it not null and you gave it a default, it would do a complete table rewrite. You did this on a table that was a couple of hundred gigabytes and your alter table didn't run very fast. Uh, Postgres 11 will let you do that without a rewrite. And it'll basically store for the future and then as the table gets rewritten for other reasons, like you're updating other columns and things, it'll, it'll partially materialize this value into the table step by step. Uh, so it actually gives you uh, the use cases. There, is, there are some things that will still require a rewrite. Uh, you do need a function that is non-volatile uh, to make it work, but for the vast majority of cases, alter table add column is now like safe. <laughs> it will not give you hours and hours worth of downtime when some Modi accidentally ran that on production. Yes? So the question is, does this help with the case of being able to add a not null constraint without that being slow? No. You can add, yeah. But no, it does not. This is, is completely unrelated to that. Uh, that's still something we'd like to have. I'll agree with that. But, uh, but it does not make that patch easier. No, they're, they're completely independent. Where is the, where is the patch yeah, but it's not in 11. Not in 11. No, so off topic. All right. <laughs> uh, so instead, we're going to move on topic. I'm going to talk about more of the SQL and developer stuff. Uh, who's using the Postgres full text search today? OK. A couple of you. We have a new feature. You know, we had uh, what is 2TS query. We had plain 2TS query. We had phrase 2TS query. Now we have web search 2TS query. Uh, which is probably what a lot of people thought phrase to TS query was. Uh, the idea behind web search to TS query is it's less picky and you can just type things in like you would normally type it into a web search engine, that's the name, and it'll figure it out for you. And unlike phrase to TS query, which will just barf at you if, if you get like bad things, this one will give you a reasonable result. So it's, it's reasonable to take this and actually take user input and just dump it directly into this function. It supports things like quotes to use double words and an or negation. Things like that are all supported. Stephen. When are we going to have this on the archive? Not until 11 is released. <laughs> uh, so basically, if you're using things like phrase 2 TS query, you can just, you should probably consider just replacing it with this. You should obviously verify that first. Uh, but it's going to be uh, pretty simple in there. Uh, we have a couple of enhancements to the domain functionality. In particular, there were two things that you just couldn't do. You couldn't create, you could create arrays of everything, but you couldn't create arrays of domains. Uh, now you can create arrays of domains. And you could only create domains over sort of simple types, not over composite types. Well, now you can create domains over composite types. And of course, you can also create arrays over domains over composite types, which could be an array over a domain, yeah. Okay, you know, the rabbit hole goes way down. Uh, but basically, the sort of edge cases of domains that just didn't work before, they work now. Uh, but at the SQL level, uh, what I would say probably the biggest thing that's added to Postgres 11 is the updated support uh, for more window frame clauses. Uh, hopefully, everybody knows what a window frame, or maybe at least what a window query is. Maybe not what a window frame clause is, but at least what the window query is. These were added in Postgres 8.4. Uh, Postgres 11 brings in the support for range between and for exclusion clauses and for a couple of other minor things, which means that 
uh, Postgres 11 will have full uh, SQL 2011 support uh, for window frame clauses. And, and according to our resident um, SQL standard expert, uh, Postgres will be the only database that has this at this point. You know, hopefully the others will catch up. But these are really useful. So previously, you could only do rows between. Now you can do range between. So you can look at values instead of rows. Yeah, I'm going to show an example because I can't explain that without an example. <laughs> so if you look at this example, uh, you got, uh, I got a very boring table. It's got the numbers 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. You know, it keeps going. Obviously, I created that during, using the function generate series. If you've never used the function generate series, Add it to your notes, go look it up. It's really useful, particularly for generating things like test data. Um, so the first clause here, the sum, one, sum i over order by i rows between two preceding and two following, that's what we could do before. Now that tells Postgres that as the results sort of go through the data, create a window that starts two rows prior to the current row and ends two rows after the current row and then calculate the sum of the values in that. So on the first row here, it's going to calculate the sum of, well, the two rows here that don't exist, and then the one, the three, and the five, which gives me nine. On the next row, it's going to count the one, the three, the five, the seven. And then on the next row, it's going to count the three, the five, the seven, the nine. Like, it keeps going that way, and it just moves through. Right? Now, the difference that we can do in Postgres 11 is instead of saying between rows, we can say uh, range between two preceding and two following. And at this point, it's not going to count two rows. It's going to do all the rows until the difference between the value in the current row and the value in the other row is greater than two. Right? Uh, so in this case, yeah, I don't really need it. This one is one, three, five, seven. OK, that's actually, I could just say rows four. <laughs> kind of makes the same thing. But the interesting thing is this works with other data types as well. Uh, a common use case would be you could say, I want a sliding average value per week, so I will just do a date time field and say range between whatever that, well, three days before and three days after. Like it works with all the all sortable data types like that. Um, one, in this case, yes. So uh, yeah, so I do the uh, I do the order by i tells you to put them in that order, uh, and yeah, so these are, are will be in the order of i uh, going back up. You could do sum of C within this, yes. You, I could do sum of a different thing within this week kind of thing, yeah. So that's particularly doing it with timestamps is a very useful case where previously you basically had two choices, right? Download all the data to your application or write a stored procedure. Uh, those were your only two choices. Now the other thing that we've added is then the ability to just say exclude. The easiest one being you can say exclude current row. So you say I want to look at all this data but exclude the current row. Or you can say exclude ties. So exclude all rows which have the same values on multiple rows uh, to count unique values and, and summaries across those things. Uh, so this opens up another sort of complete set of things that we can now do with window queries that we simply couldn't do before. Uh, and the other big thing at the SQL level, I just mentioned it, and I was actually wrong because I said you could use a stored procedure for it. You couldn't really do that because Postgres didn't have stored procedures. We only had stored functions. Well, Postgres 11 has stored procedures. Um, what does that mean? Well, previously when we've talked about when Postgres has used stored procedures, and it, this is going to be a problem for a lot of the people working in you know, Postgres advocacy because we've been saying for 20 years that one of the good things about Postgres is we have these excellent support for stored procedures. And, and we didn't actually have that. We only had stored functions. And what we call stored procedures were basically a stored function returning void. Um, these new things are actual stored procedures. Uh, they're following the SQL standard syntax, which means instead of saying select my functions, you now say call my function. That's probably not the most exciting part. Call my procedure. I can say call my function if I create my procedure and name it my function. <laughs> uh, but the interesting thing that we can do here, and the thing that a lot of people have been asking for, uh, and that's particularly uh, for those of us who do a lot of migrations from other systems, it's, it's been a weakness of Postgres that we haven't been able to do this, is that we can now do transaction control inside of our stored procedures. Right? A function exists within a transaction. You can't commit a rollback from inside a function. You can raise an exception, which is going to roll back everything, but you can't say, oh, I'm halfway done now. I want to commit here and sort of start over for the next step. Like, you can't do that from within a stored function. 
Now, in a stored procedure, you can do that. In a function, you could create save points, right? But you're always inside of the scope of the outside transaction. So if the user or, or if the application calling you decides to roll back, everything you did gets rolled back, period. There, there is no way out of that. Um, so in this, I mean, an example like this, what you can do now that you couldn't do before, well, the easiest thing, instead of saying create function, you say create procedure. So I'm gonna create procedure, I'm not gonna call it my function, I'm gonna call it my prop. Uh, I'm still gonna create it in PLPGSQL, uh, just like functions, it supports multiple languages and things like that. Uh, and then in this case, I'm just doing an insert, and then I'm doing an explicit commit, I'm doing another insert and doing an explicit rollback. Now what you'd expect to happen here is that the one would go in and the two would go away, right? And guess what, that's actually what happens. So it's nice that what, ex what you expected to happen is what ended up happening. Yes? So are the procedures and functions the same under the hood? No, they, they are different. So you can't do like alter function become procedure. Uh, they're obviously like the execution engine of PLPG SQL is mostly the same. It, it has to have a few differences in order to be able to support things like these transaction things, but uh, overall, no, they're, they're, they're similar, but they're not the same. They do live in the same namespace. They do live in, yeah, that's a good point. They live in the same namespace. They still live in, live in PGProc, so you can't actually have a function and a, and a procedure with the same name. Yeah, but they have to be called using the appropriate syntax. But they have to be called using the appropriate syntax, yes. You can't use call on a function, you can't use select on a procedure. Uh, it does know about that. Uh, did you have another question? Uh, no, I think you can run call inside of it. You just have to. It's, it's, no, you, you can commit the outside transaction and start a new one. It's, yeah. I, I'm pretty sure you can. It's a good question, but I'm pretty sure you can uh, call it outside of a, or, or in another transaction. Of course, when your uh, procedure then commits, it will commit that transaction. Whereas the function would not be able to control the, the calling transaction. Yes, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> um, can you use external languages uh, for uh, other than if they PLPG support it, yes, so, so. so can you use external languages other than PLPG SQL? Yes, but those languages need to add specific support for doing stored procedures. So like the built-in languages of, of Python and Perl uh, and Tickle, I guess, uh, will have it in the release. If you're using a, a fully external one like the Java ones or, or Ruby or whatever, uh, they will have to be updated and add support uh, specifically for it. I don't actually know if any external ones have been updated yet, but I'm sure the, the ones that are being actively maintained will be updated. Uh, so, replication and backups. Is anyone actually doing backups? <laughs> yes, yeah, so you get like one hand, okay, two hands going up. <laughs> like, you guys are at least honest. <laughs> Uh, so there are a few things, that, there's a lot of things in Postgres replications and backup tend to be uh, tied very close together because they're based on the same infrastructure. Uh, just a small note, uh, at the very much the infrastructure level, there is a new function called PG replication slot advance, uh, which lets you move a replication slot without <laughs> consuming the data. So what does that mean? So a replication slot in Postgres is basically a, a standby registration. Right? You tell your server that there is a node somewhere that's interested in all the transaction log and it gets to keep a point, and Postgres will never delete transaction log that's older than this point, right? So normally, if you have a master and a standby, your standby will register with the master to make sure that it doesn't lose data. Uh, one of the issues around this is, is that the replication slots themselves are not replicated. So that if you have multiple nodes in a replication cluster, say just you have three nodes, you have a master, a standby, and another standby, and then you do a failover, then the replication slot for the third standby doesn't move to the other one. So in order for that to work, you have to actually create the slots independently on each node. At which point, that slot will then block transaction log deletion on the standby. Uh, previously, in order to work around this, you would have to literally have a replica that basically read and threw away the data. Or you had to have a job as part of a cluster manager that would drop and recreate the replication slot every now and then, um, which is kind of silly. <laughs> This new function just lets you basically say, I've seen all this data, I got it from somewhere else, but you don't have to keep it around for my case. It's probably not something that you guys are gonna be using directly, it's something that cluster management software is going to be using for you. Uh, 
to do more efficient handling of these. Uh, if you're using logical replication today, uh, logical replication in Postgres 10 does not replicate truncate. It's all very simple. If you do truncate on the master, all the data goes away on the master, and it's still there on the standby. Uh, now it will simply go away on the standby as well. You can turn this on and off on an individual publication, saying for this particular publication, I don't want the truncates to replicate, or I do want them to replicate. Uh, but the default is we're going to replicate them, because you know, it's kind of the logical thing to do. But replication is usually about making the data look the same on the other side. Uh, so it's more of an, an omission of the previous one. Uh, if you are using the built-in support for base backups, so using PG base backup or using a tool that uses the protocol for that, uh, we will now exclude unlog tables and temp tables from the base backup. The way that unlog tables, and for that matter temp tables, but uh, they work is that when Postgres starts up from a crash or from a recovery, it will empty the contents of an unlog table. It'll keep the structure, but the contents are gone because they're, they're not crash safe, right? And obviously a temp table, if you restart Postgres, they're just gone. So what we would previously do is we would include all your unlog tables in the backup, then you would restore it, and then we would delete them. Uh, which is, you know, excellent if you're selling, you know, disk space for backup servers. Uh, now we will just not include them in the first place. It sounds really simple, doesn't it? We kind of should have done that already, but we didn't. Uh, it, the only effect you should have is if you're actually using a lot of temp tables or if you're using large unlogged tables, is that your backups will now be smaller, but they will actually still contain all the data that's useful anyway. Uh, another thing that's been piggybacked on this is if you are running your clusters with page level checksums, uh, which unfortunately you probably aren't because it's not the default, but you should really consider doing that whenever you initialize new systems to, to run them with checksums. Uh, and if you do, when you run a base backup, the checksums of every data page in your uh, system will be validated as the backup is running. So previously, if you had like data corruption in a part of a table that was very infrequently accessed, when we backed it up, we would just copy the corrupt data right into your backups, because we wouldn't look at it. Now, it turns out that once we've read the data and we're sending the data somewhere anyway, that's like just adding a checksum check on top of that is really, really cheap. The expensive part is actually reading the data, and we have to read the data to do the backups. Uh, so it, what it allows you to do is you, you still have corruption, right? <laughs> if it's corrupt, it's corrupt. But hopefully with this, you will learn that it's corrupt early enough that you still have the previous generations of your backups around. You can restore a previous backup and roll forward through your well and basically overwrite the corruption. So let's talk about performance. Because that's really what you all care about, right? Uh, all the rest, like nobody really needs backups as long as your database is fast enough. Right? <laughs> or maybe, yeah. Uh, so Postgres, 9.6 introduced parallelism. Has anyone got a, a system running on Postgres 9.6 that actually uses parallelism in a, in a useful way? Okay, a little bit. I've, I've literally, between my customers, I found none. Not even one. Because uh, parallelism in 9.6 was very limited in what it could do. Now, it worked really well though. But what Postgres 10 did was it made the parallelism really useful. Right? Suddenly, I have, I have lots of customers who are using Postgres 10 parallelism with much success. Uh, but with 9.6, it's more like, yeah, it worked great in testing, and then you start running it for real, and it turns out it didn't really help most of those cases because it couldn't parallelize complicated queries. Well, Postgres 10 could, uh, and Postgres 11 uh, adds a bunch of things. It, it adds a bunch of general enhancements. It adds parallel append plan nodes. Yeah, everybody knows what that is, right? Uh, it adds parallel aware hash joins. Basically, these are things that just makes things parallelized that didn't parallelize before, and you don't have to do anything. They will just do it, right, under the same things. Uh, for example, we had, we had parallel hash joins, but we now have parallel aware hash joins. That's really clear, isn't it? Uh, the difference being in, in uh, Postgres 10, each parallel worker would actually build its own hash, and then we could merge those results, whereas in Postgres 11, they'll actually build a shared hash and sort of work on the same uh, data block at the same time. Uh, but things that are more explicit here is you now also have parallel create index, uh, which is, yes? Well, you're sitting next to the guy who wrote it. <laughs> 
<laughs> Almost. <laughs> yeah, it builds it in parallel. That's, uh, that is the main big difference, that it does build it in parallel. Which, uh, uh, so parallel create index is currently it's only for B-tree indexes. So unfortunately, it doesn't help you with things like your expensive GIS indexes or your expensive full text indexes. They're still not going to be parallelized. But for a B-tree index, uh, you can set this uh, new parameter called max parallel maintenance workers. You know, this is why we have tab completion in VS Curl. Uh, by default, it's two, and, but you can set it up to like, if you set it to 16, it'll parallelize across 16 processes. Uh, somewhere between two and 16, you're probably hitting your I.O. limit. But the fact is creating indexes can often be CPU limited, and then we can just sort of parallelize that operation directly out. In particular, if we're building indexes and like, you know, we're doing a restore or something using PG Restore, uh, being able to parallelize the create index can make a, a huge difference to the total throughput of the system here. Does it work with concurrently? I believe it does work with concurrently, but it only be tree. And that's the guy who wrote this feature. Yeah. Hi, Peter. <laughs> uh, are you going to fix it for GIS indexes and full text search for, for 12? <laughs> I know, but I want it. <laughs> uh, so the other big, uh, we had a couple of big headline features in uh, Postgres 10. One of the big ones was partitioning, right? And my personal view is partitioning is probably going to be exactly the same as parallelism, except parallelism got into 9.6, but it became really useful in 10. Right? Partitioning got into 10, it's going to be really useful in 11. Uh, it adds a bunch of the things. Uh, Postgres 10 basically added the syntax and very basic functionality, but it doesn't really make it a lot better than what we had before. The syntax is much nicer, don't get me wrong, uh, but it didn't really enable all of these things. But it set the infrastructure, it created the abilities to do it, which means 11 makes it a lot more powerful. Uh, there are a couple of good things. For example, you're now able to create a default partition <coughs> that tells Postgres where to put all the rows that don't match another partition. In 10, if, you, if your rows didn't match a partition, you'd just get an error. Or you'd have to create a partition for potentially everything, but that depends on your partitioning keys, right? Uh, it's all very simple. You create the table, because that's how we create partitions as of Postgres 10, and then you say partition of P, which, which is my table, and just say default instead of saying a range or a list or something like this. We just say default. Uh, and then everything goes in there that doesn't match anything else. Uh, probably one of, the, I mean, the, one of the core reasons of using partitioning in the first place is that it should be transparent to the application, right? The application, if, if I'm breaking my data out across 10 tables and the application has to know about it, then I can just use 10, 10 tables. The whole idea is my SQL should be the same. And one of the problems we had was if you actually updated a row so that it would be moved to a different partition, it would just fail. Well no longer the case. In Postgres 11, you can now update on the partition key, and if it moves to a different partition, Postgres will basically delete it from one partition, insert it into the other partition. That's what happens in practice, but it turns out that it actually works. Uh, you could do this before, right, by deleting it from one partitioning and inserting it into the other one, but then your application had to know. And it was up to the application uh, to figure it out, right? There are some concurrency things where, in theory, you can delete it from one, and then you start inserting it into the other one, and somebody else got ahead of you and inserted something there that violates a unique key or something like that. You already had those. Right? They were still there. Uh, they can just show up in a single command now. Uh, we have support for local partitioned indexes, uh, which basically means if you create an index on your table, Postgres will automatically create this index on every partition with the same definition, right? Including future partitions. So if you add a new partition in the future, it'll come with this index by default. You can still also create indexes on the individual partitions, which we've always supported, right? But this just makes partition maintenance much easier because if you want, like, I always want an index on, you know, the date column, I'll just put that on the main table and it'll automatically be on all uh, existing and future tables. And we have support for cross-partition unique constraints. It does require uh, that all partition keys are part of the index. But as long as you do that, you can now create unique, and you can create a primary key uh, that spans a partition table, which we just couldn't do before. Right? Now, unfortunately, some of you will go like, yes, I can finally have a foreign key pointing to a partition tables. Mm, sorry, not yet. Uh, now, in theory, you can, you can now sort of do it on your own with a trigger that queries the table because there is a unique constraint, uh, and you can do foreign keys the other way. It, it doesn't solve the foreign key on the big table yet, but again, it's an infrastructure uh, 
that's going to help us do this uh, further in the future. Hey, insert on conflict now works with partitions. It's again one of those, it really, partitions are supposed to be transparent. Insert on conflict is an excellent feature. It just didn't work with partition tables. Now it works with partition tables. Very simple. Uh, and there is an executor change that makes uh, partitioning work in a lot more cases. In Postgres 10 and earlier, partitioning looked at the query. So when you, when you sent a select query to Postgres, it would look at the query and on query parsing and planning time, it would decide which partitions to look at. And for a number of queries, that simply didn't work. If your query was, you know, select star from my table where date equals something, right? Okay, we can look at that something, we can look at your partition, we can know where it goes. But what if it's, you know, where date equals subquery? Or where there is a join in it? In all of those cases, at plan time, you have no idea which partitions you're gonna be looking at because they depend on running a different part of the query first. So Postgres would just scan all the partitions. Uh, in Postgres 11, uh, there is now a partition pruning that runs in the executor, which means it will be able to run this subquery, for example, and get the data back and then decide to throw away a bunch of partitions that are not interesting. So it'll first run a um, plan time pruning where it deletes the ones that it knows can never happen, but then it will run a second set of pruning at executor time when it can figure out that, hey, now I actually know that these partitions I didn't know about before, now I know they're not gonna be used, and then it will not scan. So there's a whole bunch of queries that would previously end up scanning all your partitions that are now just not gonna scan all your partitions anymore, which is always nice. Uh, we've added support for hash partitioning. Previously we had list partitioning and range partitioning. Right? Now we have hash partitioning. Uh, like the other ones, we just say partition by and instead of say partition by list, we say partition by hash. Uh, and then we create our partitions defining a modulus and a remainder uh, for the hash. Uh, so in this case we say, uh, let's see if I get this right. If I say modulus four, then I get four partitions with remainder zero, one, two, and three. Uh, and then I can actually switch. Uh, I can create sort of two of them and then I can take the other part of it and change the modulus, but it has to be changed to the power of two and I can only increase it to sort of get into smaller and smaller pieces. Uh, the idea behind this is as, as long as the hash, val uh, hash function is good, you're gonna get an even distribution across n number of partitions. Uh, whereas with list partitioning or, or range partitioning, you would have to know that your data is evenly distributed. Right? <laughs> it uses the standard data type hash functions that Postgres uses. Uh, I saw something just the other day on the mailing list where someone was like, I, ins you know, I inserted the value seven in my integer field and it didn't show up in the partition number seven, something like this. No, because it actually hashes the seven and then it takes the modulus on the hash value. Uh, so you don't know where your rows are gonna end up with, with your partitions, you just know they're predictably gonna end up in the same place. Um, we have the ability to do partition-wise joins, uh, which is basically if, if you're joining, uh, if your partitions has identical partition keys and you're joining on the partition key, which is actually not that uncommon, then instead of, of uh, what we'd previously do is we'd scan a partition and we'd have to join it to all the partitions in the other table. Now Postgres will know that rows from this partition over here can only ever match with rows from this partition over here and it, it joins them individually uh, one by one. Now this is turned off by default. There's a, one of those enable partition wise join or something like this is the parameter. You have to turn it on because it costs a bit more in planning time to figure out whether this works or not. Uh, We have the ability to do partition-wise aggregates, which is actually fairly similar to how we used to do, or how we still do parallel aggregates, right? Which is, uh, if you're doing a sum, for example, of something, you, well, you can run the sum once on each partition, and then you can run the sum of the sums, which turns it into an, an actual um, sort of complete sum. Uh, and this part also now knows about the partitions. So as you can tell from this, it's like a whole bunch of things that previously didn't know about partitions, now know about partitions, and, and it starts paying off. So, uh, in my book, that just says that look, sort of 11 is the one that now we're getting the payout from all the infrastructure that was put into 10 when it comes to partitioning. Uh, and hopefully in Postgres 12, we're gonna see even more stuff happening there. Uh, there's of course, I mean, there's a whole bunch of more things done in the area of performance. Uh, there's one particular that's uh, worth mentioning, which is that uh, Postgres now supports LLVM-based JIT compilation of uh, expressions uh, and of 
tuple deforming and forming. Everybody knows what that is, right? That's basically when Postgres converts between the on-disk format and the in-memory format, is one way to explain it. Uh, now, the way uh, Postgres, as you know, is a, a super pluggable system, uh, which means we have a problem. We can't like hard code the path of, hard code the optimized way of dealing with things when everything is pluggable and we can change the way things look. But what we can do is when we run a query, we actually know what the data types and their implementation functions are. So what we can do is we can just, just in time compile this as we run the query uh, into machine code uh, all the way through. So it will uh, do it for uh, expression. Ooh, I found a spelling error in my slides. Uh, in particular for expressions, uh, in particular if you're doing things like larger analytical queries, if you're doing, if you're just doing simply, you know, I'm, I'm multiplying two values across 100 million rows. Just, just in time compiling this multiplication into machine code can make it significantly faster. Uh, there is still a, a discussion about exactly what uh, JIT, I don't think JIT's gonna go away. Uh, the question is whether it's gonna be turned on or off by default. Uh, I think that's still being discussed. It's, if you download the betas, it's turned on. Uh, but there are obviously cases actually doing compilation of your queries before running them takes time. And you gotta find the breakpoint where it starts saving you time versus where it costs time. And that part is not entirely set in stone yet where it's gonna be. So that's a lot of features. Um, I don't have a lot of more time. There's always more features. Uh, and as I like to put in is, if there are developers in the room and I didn't mention your feature, I'm sorry. <coughs> I didn't mention my feature. <laughs> um, there are many, many smaller fixes. There are of course many, many performance improvements. Uh, if I were to, I could probably do a full day talk if I want to talk about all of them, but you know, nobody wants that. But what I would like to reach out to you at this point is to say, please help, right? All the developers have written all these nice features. We need you to help us test it. That's sort of the idea with open source, right? You know, the many eyes, the many tests. Uh, please download and test. There are app packages available, there are RPM packages available, they're in the main repositories, they're really easy to install. Maybe consider not putting your production on it, I don't know. Uh, but definitely consider things like if you have CI systems that run all your tests, put Postgres 11 in those. At least put a separate instance of Postgres 11 in those. Run your real world applications on Postgres 11 beta, run it with real world data, and give us feedback. Because in particular, when you look at these things like the partitioning, like the JIT stuff, it's quite likely I'd even say that there are some things that you do that are actually gonna run slower <laughs> because some little thing needs to be tweaked, there is a bug somewhere, there's something like that. And if we learn that before we make the release, it's a lot easier to make sure that it's fixed before you start looking at running it sort of for real. We're also of course interested in just knowing that, hey, we ran it and it worked. That's also good because then we know you actually ran it and didn't just you know, download it, open up PSQL and do nothing. Right? Run real world queries real world workloads on it. That's a huge help uh, for us as the developers to make sure that when we do put out the full release in hopefully about a month time, it is going to be as high quality as, to be honest, we're kind of used to with Postgres. Uh, so please download it, uh, please help us test it, and obviously, you know, as soon as the release is out within minutes, you will be running it in production. Okay, thank you all very much. Uh, if you, I think I have, what, I have one minute, so maybe a question or so, but other than that, just catch me in the hallway or, or sometime I'll be here the rest of the week. So, thank you very much.